and a very warm welcome to Sustainability Talks. Uh, this has been brought to you by Candor Tech Space, managed by Brook Creek Properties. Today's is a very special conversation with business thought leaders for sharing best practices, ideas, and inspiration on how companies, and not just companies, we as individuals can do much more for the environment. Now, every year on 5th June, United Nations celebrates the World Environment Day. What does this day do? It's a powerful reminder for each one of us of our responsibility for living more consciously, also for working with awareness of this Earth's limited resources. It's even more critical today than ever before as we grapple with COVID-19 that we preserve three basics of our health and well-being. And those are all Earth's resources, water, air and biodiversity. If you've logged in for this session, it means just like us, you too care about the environment. So we will try and take questions at the end of our panel discussion from you. You can add them in the chat box, not just questions. If you have suggestions too, you can, which you'd like to share with us, please add those as well. And now let me introduce my panelists to you. And I must say, I couldn't have asked for a better list of speakers and more diverse list of speakers. We have with us Mr. Vasudevan Suresh, Chairman of Indian Green Building Council, a passionate champion of green and driving green footprint across India cities. With us is also Mr. Samir Saxena. He's Vice President and Head for Real Estate Function, Marsh and McLennan Companies. Samir is an experienced corporate real estate leader with 25 plus years of experience in the field of strategic real estate services, facility management, and of course, workspace solutions. Dipti Agarwal also joins us. Uh, she's Location and Property Strategy Lead India and Projects Lead North, RBS. Again, a very experienced CRE with several years of hands-on experience. She's responsible for formulating and driving workplace strategy for her organization in line with the bank's goal and vision. Uh, Manit Rastogi, founder, partner, Morphogenesis. Morphogenesis and Manit have done some outstanding work on sustainable architecture and won global awards for it. They're the architects of our Candor Tech Space Kolkata new development, which is upcoming. We also have with us Shant uh, Shantanu Chakrabarti, Senior Vice President and Regional Head, India Office Business, Brookfield Properties. He's the very first person who was onboarded by Brookfield Properties in India. So his journey on taking over several existing business parks and turning them around to meet the IGBC Platinum rated rating standards has been a very, very positive. So we'll share or get some experiences on that front also. I'm going to begin, but let me thank all of you first. Thank you so much for being part of this dialogue. Let me begin with Mr. Suresh. Uh, and uh, so I think the most important question and the most pressing question today is, what would IGBC's top concern be for the built environment that we see? Has it changed uh, pre and post COVID? Uh, well, uh, as far as post COVID is concerned, some course corrections or tweaking are needed in certain situations which I'll open out later. But otherwise, our larger concern is to deal with uh, sustainable development from all point of view, which in terms of environment friendly, ecologically appropriate, energy saving, integrated water management, integrated energy management, waste management, all these put together leading to overall improving the quality of life of the people going to be in every space that's a working space or a living space or a relaxing space etc how do you deal with that how do you get as you rightly said better quality of uh, uh, air and light to be brought into the building and also bring in substantial amount of saving which you said natural resources very rightly said about 30 to 40 percent of water saving is a phenomenal component and around, around uh, uh, equally about uh, 35 to around 45 percent of energy saving, which is equally uh, relevant, get to the waste management to net zero level. And we are getting into net zero energy, net zero water, and also waste management component in a large way. And actually, if I can open out for a minute, if you have the time on that, and our uh, contribution of roughly over 7.2 billion square feet of green footprint, uh, number two in the world, and we have been able to bring for uh, in that particular component about 9.3 billion units per annum of energy saving which will be about 25 million villages can be uh, uh, laid over there water saving of 28.6 billion liters per annum the whole city of Hyderabad can be looked after and mitigating CO2 emissions which is very important about 7.6 million tons per annum 
which would be about 8.6 million cars off the road so what i'm trying to say is quantitatively you are able to measure the sustainability component and the impact it can lead to the quality of life being enhanced for a building which is rated under uh, the igbc all the asset classes uh, mm-hmm. predominantly on the office spaces and the residential spaces hotels hospitals uh, colleges campuses what have you all all asset class are covered over there including built environment of a larger nature from buildings to the green built environment is a larger right. cost that have been working hmm. so let me ask you a question uh, with the lockdown do you believe that the targets that you've set out which is 10 billion square feet of green footprint uh, by 2022 is that on track sir absolutely on track there is no okay. there is mm-hmm. no problem at all we already have done 7.2 billion square feet uh, as on date we'll be adding by the end of this year another about uh, 800 million that will make it to about 8 billion by the end of the year 2020 we got two more years or two 021 and 2022 all right we'll come back to suresh a little bit later samir let me come to you i've gone through the marsh and mclennan company sustainability goals and i'm quite impressed with the targets that the organization has set for itself and best practices which are underway but i'm going to ask you a very it industry specific question now if i look at the india's space in the world or place in the world when it comes to it it is one of the largest globally help us understand some of the best practices that the industry is adopting to reduce its carbon footprint globally and here in india okay so perhaps i'll i'll quickly touch upon the global one first and i'll perhaps divide it into four parts uh first one being the real estate the second one being the procurement third is the technology and fourth is the corporate travel so this is how i would categorize it. so in terms of the real estate so it is about green leasing green space design design lead certifications uh, also about how do you optimize the footprint so currently we are there in 140 countries worldwide with almost 800 offices so this has shrunk the, uh, the footprint over a period of last 5 years primarily with this uh, object in mind and, and within the real estate i think uh, we have been looking at uh, sourcing products which are eco friendly whether it is furniture carpets chairs etc etc and and to go on the next point which is around uh, procurement again focus on green sourcing evaluation of the products which is based on you know unit cost transportation disposal overall environmental impact right? we have been signing up with suppliers for climate change and in fact mmc was chosen by cdp as the supplier engagement leader and we have been using our to in fact uh, buy energy in uk and as we speak today we are on 100% renewable energy in all our uk offices if i talk of uh, technology 17000 plus maybe physical and virtual servers in fact virtual and physical server all they focus on energy efficiency uh, we have been switching from desktops to laptops we have been putting servers in the cloud so even after addition of 900 servers our actual consumption in electricity has gone down we have been working on corporate travel obviously 400 million air miles that we clock every year with almost 300000 room nights but then focus has been how do we how do we go on to environmental friendly travel options when we have we have the options of using bus trains car pooling etc etc and specifically one of our group companies oliver wyman they have been they have been kind of working uh, with ellen macarthur foundation on uh, new plastics economy the global commitment and and they have been coming out with some of the uh, thought breaking ideas on on this front uh, so that's that's about uh, in terms mm-hmm. of in terms of india i would i would say a uh, lot of organizations have done it and we also have adopted obviously electricity the main one changing thousands of led lights uh, f- uh, fitting in timers we we have almost had 8% savings as far as uh, the energy is concerned in the last uh, i think 2018 uh, inducting uh, solar panels at multiple places in terms of hvac we have remodeled we have been using vfds we have been using vrv machines inductor introduction of sensors green chemicals Uh, again on focusing on water conservations 
We have been using sensors. You have been STB waters for adequate purposes. Mm. And and the upper, and one of the important part is transport. Yes, we have recently converted all our fleet from diesel to CNG. And also, CNG. Last, I would say, big thing about awareness, creating awareness drives and communicating with the colleagues so that uh, you know whatever as an organizations we are trying to, we are we are trying to do they are the ones who would adopt mm. their lifestyle of course absolutely absolutely so me so what i'm hearing is that it's not just one thing there are just so many tiny little things that you need to do to get on to that uh, green journey isn't it uh, let me bring in deepthi here Deepthi, RBS also has set up very ambitious new goals to continue their decarbonization, aiming to be actually climate positive by 2025 for their operations. Can you tell us some of the concrete steps RBS is taking here in India and globally? Of course, we'll come to it later, or you can decide which one you'd like to start with. Thank you. So I think I'll start first of all with the global journey, and because that's that's how we start with uh, climate change is at the heart of our operations. In fact, this year, the start of this year, uh, we become a purpose-led bank, and climate change is one of our three main pillars that we focus on. The ambition, as you've said, that it's uh, we want to become a leading bank in UK and Ireland uh, to help address the climate change. And most of our uh, uh, climate change agendas are in line with 2015 Paris agreements. So uh, we want to become climate positive by 2025, as you just said, and it's a very uh, ambitious goal. Uh, it's a very broad spectrum. Uh, there is no set methodology to it. But what we have done is that we are addressing it in two folds. We are addressing how do we manage the climate change and how do we manage our direct mm -hmm. impact. Managing the direct, direct change is something uh, which, is, uh, which is indirectly influencing. Uh, we have taken internal conscious calls of how and where can we contribute, where all we can influence and how to do it. Uh, there are four major pillars that we have defined of how do we influence this. First of all, we are saying that we will help to end the most harmful activity. What that means is okay. that we will stop lending and underwriting companies with more than 15% of activities related to thermal and ignite coal, unless they have a credible transition plan wow. in line with the agreement by the end of, 20, uh, end of 2021. Okay. So that's a big commitment that we've done as a bank and a conscious decision. Uh, the second pillar that we are talking about is how do we accelerate the speed of transition. Uh, we will support the UK and Ireland customer to identify and increase their energy efficient uh, uh, energy efficiency in their residences. Uh, we will mm -hmm. incentivize, we will uh, promote more products, how to in incentivize to move towards energy efficient homes. Uh, we plan to collaborate cross industry. So we are intending to do whatever it takes to uh, reach that goal and be a spearhead and a leader of how will how it has to be done. We'll create products, we'll create services that will uh, enable the customers to track their carbon footprint. We will support the drive to decarbonize the UK transport. So multiple ways of how we will accelerate the speed of transition towards the green energy. Uh, third mm -hmm. pillar is that uh, it's a very important one. How do we champion the climate solutions? Uh, we've said we have committed that we will provide additional 20 billion for funding uh, for financing the climate and sustainable finance between 2020, between 2020 and 2022. So that will go uh, for all the renewable energy projects like solar, wind, thermal. So uh, a lot of uh, financing that will go on, onto it and to promote this. Lastly, we will embed all the climate culture into our decision making. So that's at heart of our decision making, whether what we are doing will impact our climate positively or negatively. How do we do that? So mm. those are the broad uh, uh, factors that we influence. Then we have actually come down to how do we manage our direct impact? That is where we actually talk about how do we reduce our carbon emissions and how do we offset it? Reducing carbon emissions, there are certain ways Samir has also talked about. Uh, majorly, those are the uh, carbon emission ways, a uh, slew of things that we will do. And uh, and in terms of carbon offsetting, uh, we plan to, in our UK operations, uh, we are planning to become uh, carbon neutral as of this year and go right. on to be a, uh, climate positive by 2025. By we'll 2025. keep on buying. Well, that's not a long-term solution. But till the time we mitigate and... Uh, uh, eliminate the source of the carbon emissions, uh, we will keep on buying. And by 2025, that's how we become climate positive. 
Wow, so Dipti, can you imagine there's already a question, which of course I'll come to later, where someone's asked, how is, is RBS going to do energy incentive homes? But I think part of it you've answered, just the fact that even as a lender, you're so conscious about what sort of a business will you lend money to. That itself is an extremely positive uh, incentive for companies to make sure that they don't have more than 15% of their energy consumption through thermal. All right, uh, Manit, I will come to you, but I will come to you last because I'd like you to hear everyone and then sum up for me in some of the key takeaways in terms of best practices. Uh, Shantanu, over to you now. You know, you took over a big portfolio and uh, what I've understood in all my years of doing real estate is that if you're building from scratch, it's so much easier to make a building sustainable, built green, built for just energy savings, built for water uh, savings, everything. But when you're retrofitting is so much harder, what has been your learning in, in taking two of our parks IGBC platinum rating? Uh, so thanks, Manisha. Uh, Manisha, in fact, it's three. So we've also got Calcutta now. Uh, oh, three. Oh, Oops. Uh, so I think you're right. You're right uh, that you know, was gold. I just mentioned two on platinum, but all right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd like you to take it to platinum, Shantanu. That's why there's pressure there. <laughs> sure. No, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and you know, uh, you're right. You know, when we're you know when we're retrofitting, it's almost like trying to uh, mend something which has not been done for that intent. Uh, so that becomes a very, very difficult, uh, you know, uh, task. There are, there are easy goals to achieve, uh, you know, something like, you know, when you, when you, when we do changing the, uh, lights to LEDs, uh, you know, we, we Thank do, you. Some, Thank some, you. you know, savings, uh, we, uh, not just on the, you know, a carbon, but also on the energy consumption, etc. But I think, you know, uh, the, the initiatives that we have to do, are much beyond the built environment per se. You know, we have to also look at how uh, how our uh, uh, occupiers are able to latch on to that benefit, and secondly, how can we create a a shared economy within mm -hmm. our our ecosystem so that there's no duplication or uh, of uh, efforts or or resources. Uh, and that's something that we have tried to do, which has helped us quite a lot in, in some of these journeys that we have made, where uh, these buildings were, uh, you know, not designed for, uh, you know, uh, certification, but you've finally been able to get them get, get them certified. So one is, of course, we've, we've looked at, uh, you know, shared transportation in a very, very big way, right? You know, our, our initiative of, of getting shuttle, uh, you know, on board uh, and, and getting our occupiers to latch on to it, you know, has been very, very helpful. In fact, you know, RBS uh, has been one of the biggest, uh, you know, gainers from uh, from that initiative bars. They were able to re-strategize their transportation um, uh, and, 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 provide this kind of a solution we we have initiated with uh, you know uh, carpooling communities within our uh, uh, within our uh, uh, you know campuses uh, right gone ahead and, and installed uh, you know uh, chargers electric, electric chargers so that uh, you know uh, our occupiers can move their fleets transportation fleets from a, a, a fossil fuel based uh, fleet to a uh, to a to electric electric fleets uh, we have done we have done one of the largest uh, solar power uh, installation on our rooftops. While rooftops gives a very, very minuscule substitution as far as power requirement is concerned, but it's it's a, it's a positive step. Uh, we are now looking forward to a mass scale power procurement. Uh, you know, if we are able to you know cross some of the you know regulatory hurdles there, which which we are confident we may be able to. Uh, but that's that's the that's the way forward. Uh, so that's I think the gamut of it. Mm -hmm. we, do all of these things, we will be able to get it. Uh, we, I mean, all of this has been very energy focused. And, we've, and the other aspect is water, right? You know, the, the, the buildings that we acquire uh, were designed somewhere in the early 2000s or late 1900s, uh, 19, 1990s. Uh, and, then, and at that particular point of time, these concepts were not as pervasive as, as, as they are today. So the focus of design it's, itself was not there. So we had to kind of really work on the entire water conservation system and water re recirculation and reuse system uh, to ensure that we become a zero discharge facility. You know, you know, you know, there was a lot of fresh water being used 
in uh, you know in our uh, uh, in, in in the washrooms which is not the best way of utilizing them you could you could recycle water and use for flushing and all of that so all the either the entire system had to be designed and retrofitted so that you know we could uh, you know uh, we could do all of that and and finally all like right. it, you know providing a platform so that our occupiers could latch onto it i mean we may do our bit in the common areas but if we can provide a platform where our occupiers could latch onto it and also create uh, you know positive impact for their operations i think that is what uh, you know we have been striving to do all right lots of ideas i know because uh, everyone belongs to a very different industry uh, ideas have been quite diverse so manit you heard it some some approaches are very top driven where you set up sustainability goals and then you use a very different approach some on ground some through financing some through business the way you will do your business other are far more practical you can break them down into procurement real estate finance and daily practices and then adopt it uh, tell me from what you've heard what is the sense you're getting i mean what what do you think is the current priority of businesses when you're looking at reducing carbon footprint and going forward should there be a shift or this is the right direction so thanks manish you know on a on a lighter note uh, you know i've been sitting and listening because uh, you made me last uh, and right to so uh, is that if anyone from our side of this planet was to hear this conversation they would you know, the the reaction would be what the hell were you people doing till now <laughs> everything that everyone has said should be you know, is what it should be you know so i mean igbc has done a great job i've also i also worked with them however i would not like to put it as how much energy has been saved it shouldn't have been spent in the first place how much water has been saved that is wrong it should not have been wasted in the first place right. how much money is going to be given to uh, companies that are uh, are not uh, are working with renewables or not working why would we why would we have, why would we why should we be funding polluting companies in the first place so the point is you're all doing a great job don't get me wrong i that way said so a lighter note it's just that it okay. is incredible to hear at you know how little we are, we are doing today in terms of trying to save the planet and save humanity and you know god bless covid because it's sort of you know really woken up everyone mm -hmm. and to answer your real to your answer your question uh we need to do a lot more you know a 30% reduction in energy a uh, 40% reduction in from what figures from figures that people wasted on Hmm. okay the Which question was, really is that how much energy can be really consumed to support a population of 7 to 8 billion people answer and, that for us then okay how much i don't want to come to that if if, if we were to flip this argument completely and say why are we thinking of saving energy why are we not looking at what is the least amount of energy which can be used to su support the world's population so, productively so you know that comes to the question of the concept of carrying capacity okay now if you uh, look at our city models i mean of some cities are 30 million some are 5 million some are 500000 and some you know smaller ones of 30 40000 and there is no real proportion to land to person okay now why land okay at the end of the day if you were to go with the idea of uh, carrying capacity and you should only consume what that land can afford to provide you then you should just it's a simple calculation I mean, if i take india okay and i look at the amount of solar radiation that india gets We need, you need, know, we need a point zero two percent of that in solar to feed the entire country on today's energy consumption. If we mm -hmm. take the amount of rainfall India gets, you need to save about ten percent or fifteen percent of that to get the one fifty liters of per, per, per person per day, which is like an incredibly high figure in many cases. So the question really is not about how much energy we are saving. The question really is about what is the carrying energy? capacity and are we exceeding that? And that's all we should consider. Okay, and that's mm. sort of the real cultural shift that we have to move to. Not saving from a bad position, you know, it's like GDP. If you crash the economy this year, next year you should be getting double-digit uh, GDP. That that is really GDP anything, you know. I mean, okay. you you make the base flow and you or you know, and similarly, if you're highly wasteful and you're cutting down from the one, please no one get me wrong. Damn awesome, congratulations! I'm doing the same thing. However, I really I think that this is the opportunity to make yeah. to to leapfrog. This these incremental changes of percentages from 30 to 35 to 40. We re, this is an opportunity to rethink 
recalibrate. And let me give you right. a few more examples along that line. Okay. We construct buildings. We don't manufacture buildings. Okay. Mm. Right. Now, what's the difference? Uh, and I gave this analogy to you know a class I was teaching. Okay. Uh, uh, and not actually, I think it was a seminar I gave abroad. And I was telling these bunch of uh, people in the room, I said, if you look at a car, a car is about 100 square feet. Okay. And a reasonably, you know, a reasonable car is about five lakhs. Uh, you know, you can pay. Get the luxury ones. That works out to five thousand rupees per square foot. Okay, what do you spend in construction today for a grade A building? Not that far off. Now look at the difference in technology. A car can move at an incredibly good speed. It doesn't let the water in. Uh, you know, it you know, doesn't have all that ridiculous. Speed. It can do so much more. Okay, and what a building. Take a lift. A lift costs much more than the five lakhs, and it's a box going up and down with nothing else really to it. Okay, so there is a there is a mind shift that we require in how we are thinking about how we construct our buildings. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and there's a lot that can be done. But to now coming to a very specific pain, personal pain point. Okay, that no okay. matter how hard we right, I'll go with this. Right, I mean I've been in practice for 25 years. From day one of our practice till now, we've been harping on about the fact that don't call it, you know, it's, you can't call a building green, you can't do the, you know, because as I said, my building is structurally safe. It won't fall down. It's a bit ridiculous. I mean, all buildings have to have a, you know, that's the purpose of a building, to consume least amount of resources to provide you shelter yeah. and serve the need that you had. However, the, the, the real point that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm trying to make here is that the first 15 years we spent making buildings that were, uh, I would use the term cheaper to run, hence they were consuming less and cheaper to build. So that's the Indian method of so-called green. Because I mean, I've got a client sitting on this uh, uh, panel as well. If I told them go and spend uh, you know 10 percent more and I'll make your building green, throw me out and get the next architect in. No matter what he says <laughs> on the panel today. Okay. Are you are you are you setting up to get thrown out after the panel discussion? <laughs> oh, I did say, you know, just, right. However, however, okay. Now, no, carry was, on, carry it on. Was a it's, it's a, it, yeah, it was mm -hmm. a non-brainer for commercial developers across the country to say, yeah, why not? If I can, you know, if I can design my building at 500 square feet per, uh, per 500 uh, square feet per ton of air conditioning instead of 300 or 250, and I'm putting half the equipment in and half the DG in and half of all that in and consuming, that's a damn awesome. Okay. So, and we were doing this through passive design, you know, which is not invented by us, but for a thousand years, this part of the world has been doing it. However, when okay. they go to lease, and which is why I want to make this point on this panel with, with all the people listening. Okay. All when right. They go to okay, lease, Deepa and Samir. Okay. This one is for you. <laughs> so then the developer come back to me and said, Hey, you, know, you designed this building to operate at five watts per square foot because you've cut down the you know lighting load to 0.3 watts per square foot, the AC load to you know one and a half watts per square foot plus equipment load. He said, but the, the when the tenant comes to me. They say, how, how many pata? We don't know. We want 10 watts per square foot. So go please put the equipment in. At that point, Shantanu or my, my other developers will happily go buy some more chillers and stick it in, knowing very well they will not be used. And therefore, the whole purpose where we started gets defeated. So every IPC that every occupier in who's listening to me right now and across the country will not agree these performance statistics that you know, that, I, that with half the air conditioning, it will give you the same level of comfort. They want it. And then it's a cycle of coming back to the money with Deepthi there. Okay. Because they, because, you know, the developers, uh, you know, sort of taking either equity or debt. Okay. And his meter is picking. I don't give a shit. I'll put the chillers in. I'll put the thing in. And, and you know, so there is a hope. So I'm really glad to see this panel. Because, you know, form follows finance. We got Dipti, we got, we got the developer, we got the tenants, we got you from the media and go the, at the bottom of the evolutionary food chain, the architect, you know. But if our objective is all the same, why is it that we can't get that alignment uh, when it comes to leasing? I think let Samir take over now. Manit, absolutely. I think I am I'm in agreement. But I think we have to be realistic on, on certain things like that. Look at the panel over here, right? What is the percentage of impact that we are creating on our ecosystem? That's the first point. If I look at the representation, we are not even half a percentage of the, the 
right kind of population right that, that's one i always say that you know there is 80 20 ratio which always go on so 80% is not so structured 20 is structured and even 20 which is structured there is still 80 20 which goes on so apparently people who have got this vision or the organization who would want to carry out this vision how many of them are actually there you can count them they will be in thousands out of the crores and crores which are over here so that's that's one big challenge second nothing no, no offense meant for anyone but then i think the, the thought around global organization coming in with their thought process vis-a-vis promoter driven organizations which may be msme sector and things like that they don't care they don't care and i think that's where the the biggest challenge comes in and even even whatever we do we will still we may have and, and also organizations who are structured also i won't i won't say that they are the ones who would 100% abide to what is what is right they also pick and choose right so i think what you're saying i'm only complimenting but the but the fact remains there is huge mass where we still have to make an impact there is, that's one secondly i think another point now as an architect you 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 come to me when i am creating spaces and you say hey samir this is what i think is right i say brilliant manit who is the mep consultant that who you are working with mep consultant would come and say this is what it is in terms of ups this is what it's in terms of electricity blah 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 i am ultimately a stakeholder who is going to take services i cannot turn a blind eye and somewhere or the other our consultants have overcapacitized i have never ever seen my ups is going above 20% on full capacity where i have been told you are supposed to have three of them i'm just giving an example right and it's it's not about marsh and mckinnon it is about the industry or maybe 20 you know if they they would 30% but then look at the way the overcapacitization is done and and that's where that's where you're putting stress on all the resources which are going to be there and oh the city sabhi the manufacturers lobby is much stronger than anyone else's oh yes absolutely so otherwise i'll digress perhaps we have some <laughs> on big pharma also with covid right so let's not so perhaps i'm not going that and and apart from that so this is one is mep consultant and then you have got business leaders who have got vision but then what they also have two things one in case if you are planning it in india you cannot plan without understanding the risk associated or the business resilience plan that's another part then image of india comes into play hey guys you have to let let the let more money pump be pumped in but then image of india as 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 an uh, as a country or as a destination where the the work is supposed to come in that is not going to get hampered and what happens is sensing that opportunity manufacturers consultants unfortunately they club together and wherever there is a need of x they will sell 3x and and we are we are kind of one of those stakeholders who would who would try and convince a lot of times we get successful a lot of times we don't and that's what it is but then overall i think we still have 1% of the entire industry who still is focused who's focused on creating sustainability as as one of their uh, you know uh, one of their pillars we still have to reach out to 99% so i'll i'll quickly comment on i'll give you one example 1990s early 1990s i i used to work in the hospitality industry and uh, in fact into restaurants and i was flipping burgers over there. we used to make uh, some good burgers by wimpies we had a boss who who came in and that time in 1995 he had an experience of almost 25 years in fast food uh and obviously india was uh, just starting back and he he asked us who is your competition we said our competition is uh, nirula mcdonalds etc etc so he had one simple answer he said guys they are not your competition they are the ones who are fighting with you your real co- competition would be perhaps kulche chole walas on the street so for us to get more people in we have to target those 99% to create a sus- to a create a sustainable and a huge impact and hmm. all right that's an important point very interesting discussion just, yeah go ahead just... dipti please add please yeah. add 
I will just want to add. So what Sameer has said is uh, is definitely in line with what is there, and I agree with what Mani the Mani the saying that we need to relook at what are we expensing. But uh, we need to. Uh, what I would like to add over here is we need to look at where we are currently and how do we actually go uh, walk towards that journey of becoming uh, carbon neutral or looking at uh, how do we reduce our consumption. we uh, as in india who's becoming an it platform or an it service provider to the world uh, we export our services and uh, when we talk about a multi uh, a global platform we have global standards that we need to follow we need to work on resiliences we need to ensure that uh, even if there is a power outage we have sufficient power back up with us to support that so uh, having said that yes 20% of the ups would be utilized or 30% of the ups would be utilized but all these systems are also designed keeping those resiliences in mind that is something that we need to take care of uh, while designing our buildings that's where we end up over capacitizing as well but everyone is learning everyone is recognizing and we are also moving towards uh, towards optimizing those standards uh sirish you've been hearing this conversation is moved into a completely different sphere uh. so you know how little we are doing but then the thing is that we got to start somewhere uh yeah. just just what is your uh, opinion in terms of going forward are we setting uh, setting the bar too low uh, because even as you started off the conversation said yes 10 billion square feet is possible in terms of green footprint and these are the stats of what we are saving do you think that we are setting our benchmarks to low and we should really after the covid-19 and the fact that climate warming uh, global warming is is happening much faster than we anticipated a year ago we should completely change the way we look at business and sustainability some other areas will come uh, manisha you very rightly indicated for example an immediate issue that came to everybody's mind is the indian medical councils view and they brought out a guideline document which is now an operative document which says that air condition spaces that we have that really spreads infection in a large way so therefore the green building council along with istre has got into that in very minute detail and then identified what needs to be done therefore the present ex- existing buildings as well as the new buildings going to come up over there what are the things to be done in respect of the temperature controls as well as filters and other related aspects to ensure that the uh, uh, infection can be completely uh, avoided because all the spaces that you have the office spaces or uh, it offices or which will be the one banks or whatever they all require a good quality space there this is one of the areas that will be coming into a large way and digital transformation is a very major area where we have to really now communication now we are having this program over there everybody is doing in a digital way in a virtual way i think deepthi very briefly mentioned about that and that's an important area where all the buildings have got to be designed from that particular point of view in terms of spaces that we are going to create over there and we are aware the way in which uh, all the uh, um, commercial spaces and other related spaces in terms of design the passive designs and the active designs will undergo changes and the mep of people have to play a very very important role in this particular uh, component be it on the uh, various loads that's coming and i think one of the areas is health and well being is going to be a very important component not only normally we would have looked into the hospitals and healthcare buildings that's another another uh, segment on which uh, already the rating is going on but how to use large number of the living and working spaces to have the best quality of life in terms of the uh, uh, the health and well being aspect is very well brought in whether you talk in terms of the bp right, 2.5 or bp 10 or other related issue so large number of the ratings since you asked the question directly igbc is already getting it a 2.0 version post covid on large number of those particular thing to incorporate the large number of requirements which are required be it on water or energy or waste management or other related issues which will also be able to uh, serve the realistic needs of all the thing maybe 6 7 months 8 months time we are continuing to have the same amount we won't get the normal the way it was we'll have a new normal coming and in the new normal the uh, parameters and attributes will be changed for example uh, uh, 
Manish very rightly said, instead of using the word saving, I think what is the contribution that's coming is very, very important. Uh, since he made a mention okay. of already the 10 megawatt per uh, million square feet, he, bought, he told uh, uh, 10 watt. So 10 megawatt per million square feet, can we bring it down to around 7.5 megawatt per million square feet? Lighting load, can you bring down to 1 watt per square feet or 0.6? Air conditioning efficiency, uh, Manisha, I'm sure you all must be knowing, till around 10 years back, uh, a one ton of air conditioning load was pooling around 100 to 150 square feet. Can you believe technologies are on a leapfrog? Today we are a situation where not only 650 to 700 square feet per ton of air conditioning. There are many buildings like the Infosys and other related ones bringing in the latest technological innovations by which even a thousand thousand square feet can be done with, but the different type of technology that's involved in that. It's a very major component. And saving of water again is another major issue where what needs to be done, instead of saying, uh, don't put a high level, you brought it down, instead of saying that, what is the thing you can optimally and efficiently and effectively use the natural resources? And there's going to be a, a big... Uh, right, sir. Yeah. And right. for example, if you do it rightly, if you do it rightly, off the order of around 10,000 over 15,000 uh, million tons, uh, we can easily save off uh, for every tons of carbon dioxide annually for every 1 million square feet of space that you create. That's a phenomenal one. We are able to go forward, go in a positive way. What is it we are going this we are doing on the eve of the World Environment Day? What can be the final carbon footprint reduction coming? And I just got two more points. Uh, you might be already aware. The latest national building code is the first building code in the world where approach to sustainability has been added. Otherwise, it would have been structural safety, fire safety, health safety, public safety, life safety, etc. So they have brought in the concept of approach to sustainability world on the based on the uh, uh, sustainable development goals 2030. That's already now built in the regulatory framework. That's a good positive point to build upon. The number two component is we have so far done the reduction only on scope, scope two emissions. You got to bring in the scope one emissions also importantly, and that will cover the type of energy required into all the building materials and other components also in a very large way. And that also is an area that we needs to we need to build up. People and clients, builders as well as consumers are looking to life cycle cost. For the first time, capital cost was all that you used to bother earlier. How much you brought down? But now life cycle cost of annual maintenance coming on energy, water, waste is coming of life cycle costing in a very large way, which is also now a very important component of building management system to measure. And what gets measured gets managed. And in the new buildings that's going to come, these type of things are going to come into a very large way. And I'm sure we are capturing that to provide the best, better quality of environment and quality of life and health and well-being improved in a large way. All right. Uh, great to hear those viewpoints, sir. I'm going to now start taking some questions because we don't have much time left and I'd like to stick with our time. Uh, we've got one question which has come in uh, from one of our joinees. He says, is renewable energy source like solar, wind, can they actually completely replace the usage of fossil fuel? Uh, what do you think, Manit? I mean, in, in the built environment that we are, where literally 70% of the world's population is now concentrated in the largest cities of the world, do you think that we can do 100% turn to renewables? Is that possible? Manit, absolutely, Manisha. Manisha. There is absolutely... See, the, on, on plain math, it's very doable. Okay. In fact, we have excess, you know, and that's the beauty of the planet, right? However, the problem say for a country like India, okay, if you're going to move to a renewable grid, we'll have to replace our existing grids. Our existing grids cannot deal uh, with uh, going to purely to solar or wind. And so the grids are archaic, they're not smart, right? So the level of infrastructure involvement in that is going to be very can't go to rooftop. So you will have solar farms, you will have wind farms. And you will have to have grids that work with varying capacities of, uh, of how we deal with that, number one. Number two, what we will need to do is to have buildings start talking to each other. Okay, and let me explain that. There is data that comes out of every building. In commercial buildings, you have an IBMS, it tells you all the consumption, etc. Even in residential, single, you know, even the house that you're sitting in has a meter that tells, that consumes, uh, you know, that is how, how much energy is being consumed. But this data is not talking to each other. And if you can, you can optimize, you can optimize Right then, renewables becomes a real viability. So the answer is a blanket. Yes, it's not a problem. The question 
is that it requires cooperation. It requires us to abandon statehoodness, the United States of India, and move to an understanding that as much as water does not understand the boundaries of land, neither does energy, neither does water, neither does air. So it, we, have, we have to read the arterial right. system. Hold on. No. Okay, fair enough. So you're saying that it can be done, but it will take a lot of concerted efforts and you have to do it slowly yes. and steadily. It's not something that can be done Overnight. Okay. Samir, just just this big question where Adarya, Adarya has asked that, do you get any government support for bringing in more green initiatives? So the larger question is that do you need that support at all? Should the government be incentivizing it? What do you think, Samir? I think definitely uh, as organization, the support should be extended and that's where the organizations will get incentivized to adopt Right now, the organizations, whenever they are adopting green initiatives, primarily looking at the ROI or maybe a statement which they have, we have to create. I think the focus has been like that. I think that that thought has to change, and incentivization should not be in uh, in bits and pieces. It has to be substantial so that organizations kind of push. Right? When you have SEZs, when we created SEZ, the the uh, the incentivization was substantial, and that's the that's that's the reason we had so many so much of uptake of SEZs in the country. Similarly, I think we need to have a well drafted policy. Uh, maybe there is there is uh, uh, there is some bit of it, but then I think uh, uh, a policy which can actually govern the entire structure and help in, incentivize. So we definitely mm -hmm. need, and and I think that will help us a lot. All right. Uh, Dipti, there's one more question which is asking that what are some of the uh, uh, things that you've implemented on ground when it comes to reusing, recycling, the basic practices being plastic free? Is there anything that RBS has done and can share with us on the five hours? Yes, a big thing. So I think what we we follow the uh, waste pyramid. How do we do? We first of all understand whether it is uh, whether we need to use it or not. We start from our waste collection. We segregate our waste, all our garbage disposal, uh, get into a biodegradable. Whatever we need to, whatever can be reused, we try and we reuse that. Uh, kitchen waste, wherever we uh, wherever we have control on kitchen waste, because we are in tenanted properties, we have tie up with CPCB approved vendors. We send it for vermicomposting. Uh, we collect uh, paper is something which is like about 55 percent of the waste in any of the offices. Uh, we collect all the paper into a confidential waste bin. We shred them and then we send across to the vendor to recycle. Uh, for all the furniture, we understand what can be reused whenever we exit our buildings. Uh, we will reuse. We, uh, if there is something which can be donated, we donate. We auction out to employees. Whatever is left, we sell it to a reseller, mm -hmm. which is again goes back into the market. So everything is reused, uh, repurposed. IT waste that we generate is also the similar way treated. We will uh, reuse, recollect, repurpose. Plastic we have eliminated. We have a, a campaign which is called War Against Plastic in our organization. We have eliminated all single-use paper cups, uh, plastic cutlery, uh, paper bottle, uh, sorry, plastic bottles. So a lot of things we encourage employees to bring their own water bottles, uh, stirrers. We have replaced all our stirrers uh, to wooden stirrers. In fact, uh, UK, we have actually achieved a zero waste to landfill this year. And that's a big wow. achievement. There's only a 0.03 percentage of hazardous waste, which just cannot be disposed of. That's the only thing which is going. But otherwise, everything is uh, uh, reduced, repurposed, recycled, and uh, uh, reuse that and, uh, and it you know it may sound like that's not much but I know the amount of effort it requires especially mind uh, you know just just the change in terms of uh, mind space that people have and their attitude to everything I'm going to read out this very interesting comment that Mohit Kansal has brought in and I think it's spurred by Manit's comment as well many times it has been observed that developers are not fully aware of lower operating costs and do not have complete reliance on operating about operating costs. They solemnly rely on their consultants. Is there a lack of awareness of some of the technological development? Shantanu, you want to take that question? Is I mean, are we depending too much on consultants or is that a myth? No, I think I think uh, uh, the question on whether we are depending on consultants or not, it, the question is whether we are depending on the right consultants. Uh, okay. And I think 
I think I think that's the differentiation we want to make that we have to choose the right kind of consultants and 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 it's it's sometimes a learning process. Um, you know, uh, by appointing one, you realize uh, what value they bring to the table and what they do not, and and you may want to co course correct accordingly. Uh, but you know, the question that I want to kind of uh, you know, or the comment that I want to like to make on on some few of the previous questions that have been discussed in this panel is the fact that, uh, you know, we are trying ourselves a lot in order to do a complete eradication on fossil fuel to move to a renewable energy. The amount mm -hmm. of regulatory hassles that, that we have to go through uh, for getting that is enormous. And, and of course, I understand from the perspective why these regulatory hassles have been put in. These regulatory hassles have been put in so that the state-run discounts, right, do not run out of business because that's exactly of what's course. going to happen. Of course. <laughs> uh, you know, and, 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 the, and the power producers, which are dependent on fossil fuel uh, power, will completely go out of business. So, so that's, that's one, one challenge. The, the, on the second point, uh, I think, uh, you know, passive design is something that is not understood by a lot of people, you know, even in the occupier community, right? You know, if we, if I were to go back and redesign one of our properties completely, I would, you know, we would reorient the buildings, we would reorient where the cores come in, you know, we re reorient the way the floor plates are laid out. Uh, and, and all of this was probably not done at that particular point of time. You know, unfortunately, and, and this is a question I would like to ask Samir and Deepthi, we don't see RFPs by saying that what is the EPI of your building, right? We don't see that as a question in the RFP. How much of the water consumption is there in your building, right? So sometimes when we have to take these, uh, you know, so what Manit was mentioning about, you know, how you can reduce the entire consumption of energy, water, etc., to a such a low level, uh, you know, we have to explain it a lot with detailed amount of calculations. And even those calculations are sometimes looked at with circumspection. So that's a, that's a hump that we all have to, as developers have to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, tied over and, and, and you're right, you know, you know, sometimes form follows finance and if, you know, and then leasing numbers drive finance. So, you know, leasing decisions drive design. So, you know, in some way we are in some sort of a, you know, a, a fix as a result of it, but we are, we are doing our part. I mean, you know, Manit has been very really helpful in, in one of our projects where we were, we were, we were doing it. We, we set very low targets for ourselves. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, we, uh, we were achieving that and, and we, we want to demonstrate that, uh, you know, uh, the fact that you have a lower capacity does not mean, uh, you know, you are, you are a lesser building, maybe you are a better building. So, better so building. Uh, that's something so, that we are, we are definitely trying to do. So, so what I'm understanding is that there just have to be many more conversations like these in larger forums. Uh, a very important question which I'd actually put for most of my panelists is that how can developers and occupiers work better together? And and I guess some of the points have already come in. Manit, in I don't have too much time, but in 30 seconds, if you were to recap that for us, you have both the communities here with you. You are frustrated as an architect that you're not able to bring in the best practices because there's not meeting of minds. There is intention, but just not meeting of minds. So, so wrap it out for us. How can they work better? Well, you know, the, uh, to wrap it up, the easiest way to solve this problem would be to uh, uh, to flip the way things work. Instead of occupiers having RFPs that say what I need, that what I think I need to survive, they should, as exactly Shandu said, they should reverse the RFP and say that what is the minimum, what have you done to reduce it to the minimum? Okay, mm -hmm. so if you, if you have provided in a building at 10 watts per square foot, I will not lease that building. I will only lease it if you met this performance metric. The fact that there is no compromise on resilience, safety, security, health, wellness, comfort is a given. No one will walk into a building if that's compromised. But they should be willing to put their money and and you know because all these corporates have great vision, triple bottom line, this that you know. 
but let them pay a 10% higher rental for a building that is 50% more efficient than the than, than, a, than a green building. Deepthi, that shouldn't be a problem, is it? Would you not no, be willing not, to put it? Exactly. So, in fact, uh, that is where I would want to come in. So, if uh, if a model can be demonstrated, so whatever energy energy efficient the building is, the savings or uh, benefits are passed back to the occupiers. Yes, definitely, <laughs> we would be putting putting our money over there. Super. All right. All right, Samir, your viewpoint. So I think again, I I come come more from the perspective of collaboration. I would say it is. Lot, lot of the problems is a trust deficit, I would say, uh, and and I think that triggers a lot of these aspects. Another point is usually structured organizations will go through IPC or RFPs and things like that. Why are these points not highlighted over there? Why are we only and only talking of the numbers? Why are those RFPs not designed to highlight those specific things because they are standard RFPs and that is what it results. I think we will have to collaborate and change the way the entire things are structured. So it's 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 again we have to create much larger an impact so that people can come on the same board and kind of put that. And believe me, it the the little bit of money at least for structured organization that's what I think. They, it it doesn't matter and it doesn't matter. And when when I have worked with Brookfield, I can I can definitely comment that. The kind of receptiveness that I have seen from Brookfield is phenomenal. The kind of proactiveness. So I don't see that even Brookfield would be averse to that, and neither organizations like ours they will be averse to that. But then collaboration, creating that awareness, creating that visibility, creating those communications at the right places is something that I think we need to have. All right. I you know we just have one minute left. I'm going to read out some very interesting comments, and these are just comments. But uh, uh, it's Suranjan actually has mentioned something, and uh, it's a conversation for another time. He says solar panels, windmills have lifespans as well. These are not lifetime solutions for energy. So people are actually thinking much more ahead. I mean, we've had a very very interesting and participative audience. Uh, can the panel come up with an open source program and share strategies that they've applied in their projects to reduce consumption? That's something that we should look at, Chantanu. We need to spear at that. Within Canada Tech Space, what's happening? What are some of the best practices? I think these, if they are shared, would obviously bring in a lot of uh, synergies and the collaboration point that Samir has been talking about. I'm going to uh, end because you know I'd like to stick to time. Beyond that, people's attention wavers. Uh, thank you, everybody. Dipti, Samir, Suresh. Manet and Shantanu for joining me today on this wonderful conversation. Uh, once again, World Environment Day is just a reminder that you know we need to be more aware. But I think the biggest takeaway from today's discussion is we need to collaborate more, we need to create awareness more, and we need to create much larger impact than what we are doing today with our businesses. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, lady. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Goodbye. And Goodbye. for everybody else, these kind of dialogues will continue. In fact, uh, anybody who's still with us, uh, we are going to do a series of Future of Workspace uh, with architects like Manit to see what the new normal can look like, what the interiors and exteriors uh, changes can look like going forward and what should be done. So hopefully all of you will log into that as well. Thank you very much. Goodbye.